Welcome back to the second half of our show. I am Brian Mulligan, also known as Astro Bits. I am once again missing my partner up here, Major Merger. Uh, she had booked a flight today and forgot that our event was tonight. Very sad. She will be back with me uh, for our special show and our regular show next month. So, yeah, she, I'm, I swear, she really will be here. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, astronomy in the news. I think uh, one of the biggest items that many of you know about is the March for Science. <laughs> So the March for Science happened in April, on April 22nd in cities all over the world, including right here in Austin. Um, there was, at the Austin event, there was a series of speakers. The leading speaker for the Austin event, I hope you were there, uh, was our own Astronomy on Tap ATX co-founder, MC High Z, Dr. Rachel Livermore, who is standing in the back of the room. <laughs> So worldwide, there was about a million people who attended the, the march, including tens of thousands in DC, Boston, LA, and other major cities. There was also a six-person march in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and a one-person march on Atu Island, Alaska. <laughs> Uh, there's been some controversy surrounding the march in, in, uh, regarding its impact, its inclusivity, and its goals. Uh, there's still a lot of discussion going on in, in these areas. Uh, however, while, while the march itself has ended, the organization continues to urge action on areas such as climate change, where science-based information is often ignored when determining policy, which was the entire part, point of the march. Uh, the long-term long impact of, of, the, of the marches is, is st still to be determined. All right, uh, moving on. May 5th. Sorry, May 1st, the omnibus, omnibus budget bill that included NASA's budget was finally passed by the U.S. Senate. Uh, it was signed into law by President Trump on May 5th. Uh, the budget includes a $356 million increase in NASA's budget, which is, yay? There's caveats, hold on. Um, the, so $356 million increase despite President Trump's budget blueprint suggesting about $150 million decrease in the budget. Um, much credit goes to Representative John Culberson of the Texas 7th District. Uh, Texas, of course, is, is a very big supporter of, of NASA. Um, one of the, the major areas that uh, got an increase in funding was the Planetary Science Division. Uh, they have an increased budget, includes funding for the Europa uh, orbiter mission, uh, studying the possibility for life on one of uh, Jupiter's moons. Uh, there were decreases in funding within certain divisions of NASA, including the Earth Science Division, the Helioscience Division, uh, which is study of uh, the sun, and in astrophysics. Um, astrophysics faced the largest cut of 6%. Astrophysics is the division is what funds a significant portion of all of the talks that you have heard tonight, as well as at every other astronomy on tap, um, and funds fun the, the next generation of telescopes, graduate students, undergraduate students, postdocs, and other research within the field of astronomy. Uh, the only other major funding of, of uh, or source of funding for ast astrophysics within the United States is the National Science Foundation, whose budget was largely flat for this year. All right, uh, next up, the Curiosity rover. We learned on May 14th, uh, during the show 60 Minutes, that the Mars Curiosity rover actually came within about an hour of ending its mission, rather unexpectedly, about six months into its, its mission. Um, so it arrived at the Red Planet on August 5th, 2012, and according to Rob Manning, the chief engineer at NASA JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in, in California, a memory problem with its main computer, uh, known as the pilot, caused the rover to stop functioning. Now normally, it's a uh, supposed to be able to recognize problems in and of itself and switch over to a backup computer that's on board, but it failed to do this. Um, and so the, uh, it, it, it failed to automatically switch, so the handlers had to send command to manually shut down the main computer. But, additional problem, the co-pilot computer, the secondary computer, failed to take over as it was supposed to do. 
Um, so it had about an hour to turn on before all contact with the, the rover was lost. Fortunately, the co-pilot turned on just in time. Um, and that computer remains in charge of the, the craft to this day. The main computer has since been fixed um, and is now providing backup services. Presumably they've got all the issues fixed that if it goes down, that the primary, the now primary goes down, it will automatically take over correctly this time. All right. Um, the Crab Nebula, a team led by Dr. Dr. Gloria Dubner of the University of Buenos Aires, has provided the most detailed view of the Crab Nebula, which is a dusty remnant of a star that went supernova in 1054 AD. Um, what you see here is a picture of the Crab Nebula itself. I'm sure the amateur astronomers here recognize this. Um, this is a composite image of five different images taken with five different telescopes. Um, we've got a radio component, an infrared image, an optical, regular visible light, uh, ultraviolet, and then x-ray. So all of these observations help reveal the composition and structure of the nebula, which helps us understand uh, the last moments of life of the massive stars that give birth to, to these type of, types of, of uh, supernova remnants. All right, uh, this is a picture of the small Magellanic Cloud. Uh, Stefano Rubel and an international team used VISTA, the Visible and Infrared Survey Telescope, to perform a high-resolution survey of the large and small Magellanic Clouds. Uh, since they are full of dust, we normally can't see into them very well. But using an infrared telescope, uh, we can peer past the dust that obscures most of our vision within these, these nearby galaxies. Um, and they, they mapped the history of star formation as well as the three-dimensional structure uh, of, the, of the small Magellanic Cloud and dis discovered that it formed a lot more recently than we expected it to. So our galaxy, the Milky Way, is about 10 billion years old. Uh, they found that the stars in the small Magellanic Cloud mostly formed about 1.5 billion years ago and 5 billion years ago. Uh, the cause for these two particular events is unknown. The Milky Way did have a span of star formation about 5 billion years ago. This is what led to our own solar system and our sun. Um, but the, uh, so the, the, the 5 billion year ago event in the small Magellanic Cloud may be associated with the same thing that caused our, our own sun to form. But the event that occurred 1.5 billion years ago in the small Magellanic Cloud, we have no idea why that occurred. All right, um, and moving on, we've got a new feature here in Astronomy in the News, which we call Astronomy Not in the News. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is reporting on something that hasn't made the headlines, but has been generating a lot of buzz within the astronomy community. So we look at, there's a, a website called Vox Charta that we astronomers use to keep track of, you know, recently published articles or articles that are about to be published. And uh, there's a lot of discussion on this, this board regarding what's happening. So we're going to take a look at uh, this website every month and report on you what we're talking about within our community that you haven't necessarily heard about uh, on space.com or, you know, whichever uh, preferred news, science news source you have. Uh, so this month we're talking about uh, Dr. Allison Noble of the MIT Kavli Institute. Her and a team of 18 other astronomers around the globe were studying the presence of carbon monoxide gas, that nasty stuff that you don't want in your house, uh, looking at carbon monoxide gas in galaxies about 7 billion light years away, uh, which means we're looking at these galaxies as they were about 7 billion years ago. Um, here is one of the particular galaxies. Uh, fortunately, we just saw, uh, heard a fantastic talk about the, the Hubble deep field and ultra deep field, so you you know how fuzzy the galaxies are, look like when, when we're looking at them that far away. Um, so on the left is an image from Hubble. On the right is a similar image. Uh, this is a d slightly different scale. So this far across on here is, is about that far across on this one. But here we're looking at just the carbon monoxide gas within that galaxy, um, which for this particular one isn't particularly exciting. It's you know relatively featureless, looks like just a galaxy itself. Um, but what the team found is that galaxies within clusters have about 50% more gas than galaxies that, are, that aren't in clusters. Um, so this is rather unexpected. 
uh, the gas that, that are in these clusters is used to form stars. And, and this particular carbon monoxide gas is often used as a tracer for where stars are forming. So the fact that there was so much more gas in these galaxies was, was very unexpected. Uh, what it means is that either these galaxies aren't forming stars as quickly as galaxies that aren't surrounded by other galaxies, um, or there's some process that's causing this particular type of gas and other similar types of gases to stick around while other gas is being used to, to form the stars. So we don't understand which of those it could be or necessarily why either particular either of those particular cases could be true. Um, so the team has suggested a, a larger survey of distant galaxies to uh, better understand exactly what's what's going on and, and why these why it's such unusual conditions within these, these galaxies within clusters. Um, so that is all I have for Starting the News for May 2017. Thank you very much for, for being here and coming. <laughs>